Only in Minnesota with Louis Anderson is made possible in part by a grant from the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores. Hi, I'm a Minnesotan. Ah. You knew that, didn't you? You know what's funny is no matter where I am, Minnesotans will come up to me and they do this weird little like cultish thing. I mean, I hate to say cult, but it's kind of that way. Louie, we're Minnesotans. And they give you that little look. You know, like that's supposed to mean something. Well, in a weird way it does. I mean, it kind of sums it all up. Hmm, we're Minnesotans, that's right. I mean, it's a great place to live. You get 10,000 lakes, 20,000 Swedes, 30,000 below zero weather. I mean, that creates a pretty odd combination of things, doesn't it? And tonight, we're going to look at some of those things. Odd is maybe a good word. But they're things that you're only going to find in Minnesota. And that's the name of the show. How ironic. My uncle never threw anything away. He would start with one item and then maybe collect hundreds and hundreds of the same item. I got over 400 different kinds of hammers, hatchets, and mullets. Plumb bars. Food grinders. Doorknobs. Amazing different kinds of sad iron. Egg beaters. Seven up bottles. Gumball machines. Nail aprons. 1,700 of those. I got the dozens and dozens of gadgets that most people don't know what they're for. Matchbooks. Bread boxes. Over 7,000 wooden pencils. 1,200 wrenches. Anything that he could get within reason. I, I've also got another racket that I'm really proud of. It. I whittled these little wooden pliers. I'd like to have him remembered as a master carver, a collector's collector, and of course the twine ball. It has held the record for 23 years as the largest ball of twine. The vinyl stats at this time are 8.7 tons of weight, and the circumference is in round numbers 40 feet. I would say a typical day was to spend at least one hour um, and up to three or four winding on the, uh, twine onto the ball. And how many years did he do that? Uh, 29 years total. Oh, what on earth would make a man decide to do that kind of thing? You have to be a little eccentric. His parents told him not to throw anything away ever. What was he trying to prove? Who was he trying to impress? What did he uh, not married. That may be attributed to part of it. Where did he get the twine? What was going through his mind? Did it just seem like a good idea at the time? Nearer to his death, he would ask me, what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I don't know at this time. We've got to find somebody that's willing to uh, take it. Francis was a part of, uh, of Darwin. And we felt that the attraction of the ball of twine would help in reopening the local businesses. Oh, he was a Do you want more crackers than just two? Well, what was it like before the, the twine ball was here? I was just dead. Yeah, shoot a gun down Main Street and not hit anybody. <laughs> the twine ball really was a reason to keep this community going. See, we're on the map. <laughs> what did you all think when the twine ball was moved into town? Oh, loved it. It was right in the front row. The biggest thing that's happened in the last 20 some years anyway. We're going to see the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. The thought of moving uh, the twine ball was a bit intimidating. I had been uh, reminded by uh, numerous and assorted people that it would fall apart, explode, um, and it would be a disaster. Especially when it came off the ground, you know, you're wondering what's going to crawl out from under here, like maybe snakes or some of those kind of things. It was really in good shape. 
compared to what we thought. It, uh, there was a bit of rot right on the bottom where it touched the ground, but other than that, in very good shape. Nice green uh, twine right in about an inch. You know, I bet if we unraveled that sucker, it'd roll all the way down the Fargo, North Dakota. Cause it's the biggest spot of twine in Minnesota. It was like the 4th of July. It was like to see the twine ball move down the street. This was something, I mean, they maybe never, will probably never see it moved again. So to see this twine ball coming into Darwin, it was, uh, the people were all lined up in our small community. And it wasn't probably the most beautiful ball of twine. It looked kind of skaggy at the time, but it turned into, the roundness then appeared once it was set down again. Is there a sense of community ownership, do you think, of, of the ball of twine now? Oh, yes. I think that uh, you can't walk up and down the street and feel that everybody doesn't feel that's their ball of twine. <laughs> if you could have seen the man that came out from Ripley's, believe it or not, and had wanted and had offered to put this in a museum. And as he concluded his speech and people started to leave, we'd hear, no, we don't want him to have that. That's ours. It belongs to us. There was no way they would get that ball of twine, <laughs> no matter what he offered. <laughs> Until this ball of twine didn't come in here, we didn't have people enough. Now we got interest enough so the people stop. I'm always flabbergasted how far they come. We had two boys come last summer and they drove all the way from Montana to see the ball of twine. We have a, a little mailbox down by the ball of twine. The comments are, are very interesting. We have a man that was here and he said that in his country they worship twine balls as gods. One woman from New York City um, after observing the twine ball, wrote in there, it looks just like my hairdo. I've been all around this great big world and I can't think of anywhere else I'd rather go to than the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. I think our ball of twine is the, only the real one. It's been made by one man. It's the biggest and the oldest. That's not the biggest anymore. Isn't it? No, there's two others that are bigger. One uh, that's getting a lot of recognition is in Cocker, Kansas. That's a community project where they come in and work on uh, the townspeople and the surrounding area. And then there's one in uh, Denton, Texas. They have reached a, a slightly larger physical size, but it is made of plastic. It probably doesn't weigh anywhere as near as much. This ball of twine is different than any other because it was made by one person. And that is what makes it really unique. You know, Minnesotans are obsessed with having the biggest. We've got that mega mall. Have you seen that thing? Oh, that mega mall is something, isn't it? That's the biggest mall in the world. That's what Minnesotans say. You know, they have a roller coaster in there. You know, there are members of my family who are lost in that thing. They went out to get a pair of socks, and we haven't seen them since. And there's a million people out there all doing that mall walk, you know? They're right in front of you, like they have the rest of their lives to be there. Oh, look at that. Huh? Hey, could you get out of the way? No, I have the rest of my life to be in front of you. The Tackle Box in Walker, Northern Lights Casino, and KLZ, Minnesota's Power Loon, present the 14th International Eel Pound Festival, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, February 12th through the 14th on Leech Lake. And action! <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Lifestyles of the Drunken Disorderly. <laughs> The average human doesn't get too much vacation time. He's got to really take advantage of it. And like you say, you go to Key West or Florida, you know, you can't have as much fun as you can have here. Oh, I got to go again. We're, you know, we're making the best of a bad situation. You're out here ice fishing. Perfect. You got to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Oh, oh. Oh, nice. This runs a little faster than that Kentucky bluegrass. Bring Nicholas on, let him try this coin. That's right. Fishing is kind of second or third or fourth on the list of things to do at the International Leopold Festival. And um, again, it has a lot to do with the fish itself. It's kind of a prehistoric though, ain't it? The wrap around your arm 
they're their own handle here. The eel pout after today will go back to being the lowest, loneliest, ugliest fish in the hierarchy of all fish. For two days each year, the eel pout becomes king. This is what the whole thing is all about, power. Good one. It's been called a poor man's lobster. Uh, it's more likely a destitute man's lobster. Uh, it is, in fact, cod, so you can prepare eel pout the way you would any cod. It's the slime that gives it the flavor, though. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> eel pout slime is actually tremendously therapeutic. When we get all done, it makes your fingernails grow, it makes your skin, it makes your skin soft. One of the really positive spin-offs of this whole experience may be that we may have to patent this and bottle it or something. Anybody can come to Leech Lake and catch a walleye or a northern or a muskie. You don't need any talent or any skill to do that because the lake is literally filled with, as we call them now, those rough fish. But it takes a lot of skill and cunning uh, to come to a frozen lake in northern Minnesota and a certain degree of stupidity as well to come to a frozen lake in northern Minnesota and capture an elusive eel pout, the world's only true game fish. Well, this is Minnesota. I mean, this is what we do. Where else but Minnesota, <laughs> you know? I call it my one-man hot seat. Put your uh, can of Sterno in there and light it for heat. Sit in here, backs against the wind. Do your little fishing thing right here. Howdy guys, uh, this is our wonderful fish house. It actually has a couple holes that we can actually put some lines in and carpeting. <laughs> well, last year we stayed in a tent. We're advancing slowly into the realm of humanity. It's unbelievable what people will go through hauling equipment and lumber and, and building materials uh, as from as far away as 200 miles to build these encampments for two days. And they tear them all down and take them back home again. You guys are the cities that uh, put it together to have a good time, drink a little beer, and maybe, just maybe put a line in the water. Each wing has seven ice holes. It's completely paneled, carpet wall to wall, ceiling fan, fireplace. I don't know if you noticed the fireplace. Aquarium, barrel, vaulted ceilings, TVs that point in each wing, chandeliers hanging down, and then a dancing area above that. This morning, the temperature was one below, I think. We have had festivals where the actual temperature was 38 below zero, and then the wind started to blow. And yet we still had 3,000 people standing out on the ice trying to catch a fish that nobody wants. I think that by itself says a lot about the Minnesota spirit. We pride ourselves as being very rugged, hardy, stout people who can handle almost anything. We want to let people know we really are alive and well in northern Minnesota. And we do live here uh, 12 months out of the year. We have no idea why we stay here, but, but we do. Our new crowned world champion eel pout fisher person at 12 pounds, 7 ounces, Tommy Wilson. What's the secret to catching the really big ones? Um, spit on your bait before you drop it down in the hole. What does that do? Well, it covers it with a, a human slime, and they like slime. <laughs> you proud? You bet. What you are you bet. gonna do with that fish now? Uh, throw it in the pot wagon, I guess. I I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to do with it. You know, when you tell people you're from Minnesota, the first thing they say is, "It's cold up there, huh?" Yeah, right. You know, I always thought it was the weathermen who made it so cold. You know, today your skin could freeze in three seconds. Do you do what I do? Open that door, one, two, <laughs> you're not gonna get me. You know what else? People die in that weather. Spring comes, that snow melts. Gee, there's Earl. He never made it home from that party. Those are good gloves. The most important thing in Minnesota in the winter are jumper cables. People love them, they'll show them to you. Look at, look at these jumper cables. Look at the teeth on these things. I'm thinking about taking these hunting with me next year. And God forbid if you don't have any jumper cables, because to try to borrow them, hey, can I borrow your jumper cables? 
take the family fortune. Or else they give you the one with the end missing. What am I supposed to do with that? Hold it on there. Yeah, like I want to play Phantom of the Opera for the next four years. This was a big day for the small community of Hawley, Minnesota, with the unveiling of the area's one and only Viking ship. It had taken eight years for Moorhead teacher Bob Asp to complete the Solid Oak Viking ship, dedicating most of his spare time to the task. As long as you work at it and take the time you need, that, that isn't that remarkable. No, sir. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of, uh, a matter of working at it and tell us right. You know? It's just kind of, a, uh, it is kind of a fun thing to think about doing, you know, and it's a kind of challenge. Viking ships were kind of unusual, but, I mean, harebrained ideas were not all that unusual. He liked to work with his hands, and he liked challenges, and I think probably part of the reason he did it was because people said he couldn't and said he was crazy, and that's all he needed. At first, there was an awful lot of skeptics among his own children, among his brothers and sisters, I mean, they uh, uh, kind of scoffed at him. I mean, think about it. This man out of the blue is going to build a Viking ship and sail it to Norway by cutting down oak trees with the chainsaw, and he's going to go build it in a potato warehouse, and that's just too weird. So I was just embarrassed of him. <laughs> the uh, Vikings, in Bob's research, he found that it took like 100 men uh, one year to build a ship like this. And uh, he basically did it alone in about nine years. Why do you think that was important, the whole idea of doing it himself? Because he's Norwegian. I don't know. I, I, don't know. I guess that's just part of who he was. If he got an idea, it was like a bulldog. He hung on till it got done, you know. <laughs> it's just, uh, that's the kind of fellow he was. He, he always had to have something Going. Bob, really, in your heart of hearts, do you really think you're going to sail this ship? Absolutely. <laughs> There's no, no doubt in my mind that we're going to sail it. No. When he sailed the ship back to Norway, it would be homecoming for all the immigrants. And that's why it was named uh, Yemkoms, because Yem is home and Koms is a form of coming. So it was a homecoming. We have to sail in the spring, you know, like in the spring, early summer. And then. Uh, and we hope we hope we can make it both ways in one year. Who's going to be the captain? Oh, I'm the captain, of course. That's, 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 that's understood. In 74 was when he was diagnosed as having leukemia. And at that time, he um, seriously considered that, you know, maybe he should not pursue it anymore. But he said he didn't want to sit in a chair and wait to die. So, uh, and we promised him at that time the kids and I, that uh, he should take it as far as he could. And uh, if we had to, we'd finish it for him. The longer it took, the more focused he got, because I think he was having a race with time. You know, so I, th I think in the end, it did become quite an obs obsession to finish. Oh, this is a great day. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's been an exciting day. It's, it's something that I've uh, been looking forward to a long time. and. Uh, it's good to see it out there. You know, I mean, it's hard to express in words like that. I think it's bigger than words. Just look at it and really don't believe it. You know? I think maybe he lived a few months, maybe even a couple years longer because of the ship. But see, once it was launched and put on the water in Lake Superior, and he was able to sail it on Lake Superior, it was just like his work was done. There were 12 crew members, and four of those were my children. There were three sons and one daughter, and Deb was the only woman on board. My father used to tell me when I was like nine or 10 years old that he really wanted me to go, and I thought, oh, this is crazy, I don't wanna go. And I think he was thinking it, that I was gonna be younger at that time. And then when I got to be you know, a teenager, a young woman, then at that point he was saying, I don't know if you should go or not, but by that time I really wanted to, so, so. What was your previous sailing experience? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I had never sailed before in my life. <laughs> so I was pretty crazy, I guess. <laughs> I was as crazy as he was. I had very mixed emotions when I saw the ship. I knew that they were going to make it. I, I had absolutely no doubts about that, but this was the first time 
since he died that we really had time to think that he was not with us. It was time to say goodbye to Bob. The 21st of June today. For the last 36 hours, we've uh, really went through some tough weather. Winds in excess of 50 knots. We survived the tropical storm of a force 10 winds and waves. The bad news is we suffered a little structural damage. With the water streaming in, I thought there was a chance of one in three at least that we were just going to have to give up, call the Coast Guard, and that'd be it. But we were able to plug the leaks. We probably have to bail once an hour. The storm was uh, tough on everybody, but we're steaming along towards the Norway still. There was one horrible storm. But other than that, it was, it was, I, I never ex had expected to be bored. Never, had never had expected to have day after day after day of doldrums of no wind. Never expected to see the North Atlantic like glass. You know, all those things really surprised me. We saw uh, whales on a number of occasions and dolphins and all sorts of strange seabirds. And, and that was, that was really a lot of fun. And seeing land was, of course, one of the, one of the high points. Well, the high point. <laughs> not just a rock, not just a ship, but a piece of land. Sustaining land. Let's go to Norway. Leo. It was just tremendous to see this ship come in. The first thing I did was to count from 1 to 12, and I thought, good, nobody threw anybody overboard. I was just glad that my kids were there and everyone was safe and I could hug them again. It's a pretty amazing thing to be 20 years old and to have as one of the things in your heart that you know that you can do and you have accomplished to have you know, sailed a boat across the Atlantic and help, help somebody, help my father, help someone complete, you know, complete a dream. You know, Minnesotans are inventive, including my father. He was always tinkering and trying to fix things, especially if they already worked. You know, the great thing is, one time we got a television set at the dump. You think shopping at Kmart is embarrassing. Imagine a television from the dump as you're driving by people and they're saying, didn't we just throw that out? He finally did get it working, though, after he put nine or a thousand dollars with the tubes in it. I don't know what it was. Of course, you had to watch it like this. Is Haas getting thinner, Dad? And I always wondered why my dad tinkered with things and tried to invent different projects. And then I realized one day that it runs in the family. My grandfather, a Minnesotan, invented this little thing. And, oh, of course, he sold it for 500 bucks. I'd be a billionaire right now. I'd have these things on my ears. <laughs> I'm sitting in an antique phrenology machine that's supposed to cool down your brain, removes double chins, restores fallen arches, and regenerates dead brain cells. And within six weeks, you're supposed to have a full head of hair. It's also claimed it will cure nervous disorders. But to make it work, you had to sit in front of it in the nude facing north on certain moon phases. During most of my life, I've been concerned about how easy it is to deceive people, and that's how I became a professional skeptic. To expose fraud, and medical fraud seemed to be one area that I felt that I could make a contribution. It was believed in the last century that you could tell a person's character by the bumps on your head, and this machine will rate my character. Well, I'm pretty good on current events. My amorous nature, though, is very superior. I have great capacity for being loving, amorous, and ardent for the opposite sex. The people who made the machine here in Minneapolis provided the customers with a chart showing what vocation they could be successful in based on the shape of their head. I found that I would be a good mechanic, uh, not a very good mother or nurse, but I might succeed as a Zeppelin attendant, a genius, or a farmer. The federal government didn't get involved in dealing with patent medicines until 1906. They didn't become involved in taking dangerous medical devices off the market until 1938. Before that, you could almost sell anything and make any kind of a promise. I'm sitting in a vibrating chair invented by Dr. Kellogg, the great serial king, and used in his sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. It's a very unpleasant thing to sit in, but its purpose was to make you regular.
This next item is something I've never had the courage to try out. It's a prostate gland warmer, patented in 1914. It's supposed to excite the abdominal brain of a man. I didn't know we had abdominal brains, but the patent says so. We need to train people to be more skeptical consumers. They think that this only occurred in the last century. When I point out we have some things from 1970, 80, 1990, that it still goes on today. This is a foot-operated breast enlarger pump sold in the 1970s. The operator used their foot and put this against the appropriate part of the body. The trouble was it only worked on one side at a time. It did give temporary size enlargement, but it wasn't lasting. In 1976, some four million of these were sold through newspaper advertising at $9.95 a piece. People are gullible. As Demosthenes said in 350 BC, nothing is so easy as to deceive oneself for what we wish we readily believe. And if we wish we can be cured of cancer by taking a coffee enema, we will. Some people come here are surprised that it's a working station. No, they expect it to be walled in, and maybe you can buy tickets to admission to go see it, you know? And they come in and they see that there's cars up and we got exhaust torn off and we got the brakes all tore apart. You know, we're actually working on cars. They don't believe it. Is it really designed by Frank Lloyd Wright? And what can you say to something like that? Well, his initials are right on the building is what I usually will. That's how I'll answer them is the initials are right on the building. What more can I say? This is the only gas station, as the sign says, uh, <laughs> that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for construction. The gas station was finished in 1958, just a year before Wright died. At the same time he was knocking off this little job in Cloquet, he was working on the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, which was finished after his death, a county administration building in Marin, California, and about a dozen houses. Why Cloquet? That's another question they ask is, why Cloquet? Of course, I know the answer to that one, so I usually will tell them that is associated with the Lindholm family. My father-in-law, Ray Lindholm, was in the oil business in Cloquet. And he had a very good corner in Cloquet and wanted to build a new station. So he had the courage and the financial daring to build a station by Mr. Wright instead of the conventional box that was being built then and still is. While Wright was absolutely in control, the fact is he never visited this site at all or took part in supervising the construction of the gas station. We invited him up for the grand opening. He sent a nice telegram congratulating us on it, but he never came up. When was the last time you saw a skylight in a service station? This is a great example of how Frank Lloyd Wright designed to meet the needs of the people who would work in the building. If you get the hood open on the car, just right, the sun will be shining right in there. Just perfect lighting, can't beat it. You know, the guy was way ahead of his time. Everything he does is a little extraordinary. He was a genius. What's your favorite design feature in, in this whole building? Um, probably the overhang. At the time, even when we first came in here, which was in the early 80s, there wasn't many canopies around as everything was wide open. Everybody's pumps sat outside. It was kind of nice to come to a place where you had a roof over your head. All the fuel was to be dispensed through the roof of the building is where it was supposed to come from. Uh, it didn't meet certain state and federal fire codes, so it was something that they were never able to do. It would be different. Welcome to the lounge. This room, as it turns out, is really the most important aspect of the whole building. The room is not important architecturally. It's really more important philosophically. In Wright's mind, the gas station was a key element in a bigger idea that he called Broadacre City. This was an imaginary landscape. It was never built. It was really an expression of his utopian concept for the remake of American culture. You're for an end to cities, an end to congestion. Uh, Not an end to cities, but an end to congestion, all yes. Right. All right. The idea was to disperse the population across the entire American landscape. The function of the service station would go way beyond dispensing gas. This was going to be a meeting place. 
this was going to be the venue that would replace sitting around the pot-bellied stove in the general store talking over the issues of the day. This little room was the place where the details of democracy would be worked out. It's real convenient for customers. It gives them a place to sit and read a magazine or just watch traffic if they want to. I'm really proud to work here. It's, it's part of Cloquet now. If it could be stored, recorded that I worked here, you know, it's not a very important job that I would have any kind of certificate or anything like that, but that would be nice. I would like to have something like that. You know, Minnesotans are pack rats. My mom was one. She collected all kinds of gadgets. In fact, you could call out something. Mom, do you have a left-handed egg beater? I think I do. She'd run and come back with it. She'd always have junk piled on the stairs of the basement. My dad would kick it over and he, ah, 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 ah. And my dad was a collector too. Hey, stop, there's a good box. You can't get boxes like that. Well, put your mother's junk in it. I remember one time I was with my mom. She goes, look, a shoe. I go, mom, it's in the freeway. That's a good shoe. So I'm out of the car, dodging Winnebago's, or they're dodging me, one of the two to get the shoe. And of course, six months later, we find the mate going the other way on the other side of the freeway. We still have those shoes. We actually own about 400 accordions. We have a wide range of instruments from all different countries of the world and eras of production. I have instruments that are worth next to nothing and instruments that are very expensive, up to $50,000. Not only is it a lot of instruments, it's a lot of anything. <laughs> Certainly it has a direct impact on our life and on our lifestyle in the home and elsewhere. I think it's because we have a passion and I love what we're doing. I'm perhaps nothing more than a child in a toy shop. I love what I do. My mother studied accordion performance and repair in Germany, and since I can remember, I can't remember when I actually started looking inside the guts of the instrument with her, but I stuck my nose in her business and watched her work and was fascinated. Of course, I have already released the screws. But you see these rows of buttons, some of them are quite loose. Accordion information is abysmally low in the United States. Many of the qualified repair people have come from the European continent. They are now elderly, and very few are training anyone at all. It's not going to continue much longer unless we get new blood. Yeah. How's the rewaxing coming? Ah, uh, the rewaxing is uh, coming slowly. We see terrible damages done by people without proper skills. Somebody must have been in here because some of the plates are too big for the block. Because of the complexity of the accordion family instruments, it really is not easy to teach. I believe the students find themselves overwhelmed in some moments, but uh, quite confident later. I mean, it has things in it that I never suspected, like beeswax and little leathers all over the place. Everyone you get in, it's like starting over, as far as they're all different. All of the accordion family instruments will likely come across their work desks, and they'll need to know how they handle and how they feel. And so it's important to our class that everyone can play all of the instruments successfully. And when we all sit down and jam, it, that's the reward. You didn't play accordion at all before you came here? Not a lick. Not a lick. The day before I came, I had never picked one up in my life. It's a blast. It's a real blast. I hope I'll never stop. I hope I can continue with this until the day that I drop. I can't imagine retiring from something which is a hobby, which is a joy, which is, in fact, what makes life interesting.
You know, if you're a celebrity and you're from Minnesota, they claim you. You can't get away from that. Oh, he's from Minnesota. That's Louie. He's a comic. And there's Bob Dylan and, of course, Prince. Of course, you can't call him Prince anymore. You call him this. And you know Minnesotans think, hmm, I think he might have crossed the line on that. Being a symbol instead of a name. You know, I think I might try that. From now on, I want you to know me as... It's a donut for you people who don't know. You health conscious nuts. This is our town, Hibbing, Minnesota. I liked him a lot. He was a nice person. When he was here, he was Bob Zimmerman. And I and most people would never have anticipated that that young man would end up as popular in music as he did. I always, I'll never forget Bob came and said, do it this way, because he knew exactly what he wanted. He'd come up you know, and say, play the drums this way. His band used to practice in the garage. My children were going to bed, and that music was loud. And I used to think, that Zimmerman kid. They weren't particularly great. <laughs> but I'll tell you, my kids grow up, grew up saying, we lived across the street from Bob Dylan. The sale of a two-story home in Hibbing, Minnesota is drawing a lot of attention from investors and media alike. The sale of Bob Dylan's boyhood home may be just the beginning of what one realtor sees as the next potential Graceland. Every time I showed the house, I had to have blown in the wind or lay, lady, lay, lady, lay, you know, on the radio or on a tape. People actually wanted to take a piece of this carpet off the floor. I couldn't imagine that, but they did. You know, heart surgeon flew in from the Texas area. When he walked into Bob's bedroom, it was reverence. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. He even made the comment that he thought at one time he was Bob Dylan. And uh, I, I'm a salesman. That's my job. Fine. You want to be Bob Dylan? Fine. Let's go. So out of all of these calls and requests and inquiries that you got from all over the world, who ended up actually buying the house? Where were they from? Uh, the Frenches. Uh, in fact, they only lived a block from the home. Now, they have the Bob Dylan myth. Have you received any mail from him? Have you heard from him in any, any way? We haven't had any contact with, uh, with Bob whatsoever, no. What would you do if he did call? I'd invite him in for coffee or a beer. You may call me Bobby. You may call me Zimmy. You may call me anything. No matter what you say, you're still gonna have to serve somebody. We have a couple of worshipers stop in on again in the summertime. They want to touch things that Bob may have touched. This is uh, supposedly the piano that Bob Dylan played while he was in high school. He was in the uh, Latin club and he was in the social studies club during his senior year. He was an ordinary student in my classroom, took part in discussion, did well in my classroom, as a matter of fact. His brother told me to make stuff up. I ran it. He came up here once in this last summer, and I asked him, how, you know, would, how do you deal with the worshipers? What am I supposed to tell them? They asked me these questions. He said, just to make things up. He said, it's more fun that way, so. Most of his efforts were in music, as you perhaps would anticipate. Where did he sit? Well, I'll just grab any seat out of the audience and say he sat right there. It's not really lying. I'm sure he sat somewhere in the auditorium. Bob might have been way ahead of his time in music, particularly when he put on a program for us in the auditorium. Of all the things I've seen done in the auditorium, I think it's the most vivid memory. It was a talent show. The program began very nice. 
and he pounded on the piano. He and he stood up when he pounded on that piano, just like Jerry Lee Lewis. But nobody's dancing better than me. Uh, rumor has it that he broke one of those pedals. He didn't have the greatest voice. And he was on a stage in which Glenn Miller had appeared, Guy Lombardi had appeared. You can almost feel the vibes coming off it, can't you? And the students just went crazy. They booed, they yelled, they screamed. It was way out of line. I shouldn't tell you what I did. What did I do? <laughs> we had to drop the curtain on him. I was upset. I think there were a lot of people that were upset, because Bobby was great. For the loser now will be later to win for the times they are changing. I just really don't think most people were conscious of how much talent he had. You know that he did say that he wasn't from Hibbing. No, I don't think he has fun feelings of Hibbing, and, and if he does, God bless him, but if he doesn't, God bless him too. But if he doesn't want to be from Hibbing, he shouldn't have to be from Hibbing. He could be from wherever he wants to be, you know. <laughs> Chisholm, maybe. <laughs> well, I feel very good. I have a student that's out there shaking their place around a little bit. Even though he let us down a couple of times, we still think that he is doing, he did very well, mm -hmm. and we wish for him the best. We're proud to be the iron ore capital. We're proud to be living in our town, Hibbing, Minnesota, USA. Welcome to the 1993 Bob Dylan Sound Alike Contest. Each of our contestants will be a vessel through which Bob Dylan will resound. Once upon a time you dressed so fine Through the bum sky in your prime Didn't you? Never did like mama's homemade dress Papa's bank was buzzing big enough And he was standing on the side of the road And I Separation It pierced me to behind Take a complete foot face full of black soot Talk about the heat put plants in the bed Put the phone text anyway Make it says that many said it must But an early made Oh, this one the DA Yes, I see you got your Brand new lips can peel wax hair How many times must a man look up? Here's my friend He's blowing in the wind. He ain't is blowing in the wind. Yeah, baby, let me follow you down. Won't you let me follow you down? I'm doing that thing in this god almighty world. If you just let me follow you down. <laughs> they sat together in the park. The evening sky grew dark. The hour is getting late. Okay, one, two, three. He told me if I heard the one about the Eskimo and the ice pick, I said no. Is that one that tell up in Hibbing? San Francisco asked to be loud. You're gonna have to leave me now, I know. Okay, help me out. The cup of a blind man at the gate. I forgot a simple twist of fate. All right, we got it. Be released. Who killed Davy Moore? One was 
what's the reason? Why and what's the reason? Why and what's the reason for? Dream I ever had. Recently, I was in the Scandinavian countries and I felt so at home because I'm part Scandinavian. Oh, who would have guessed? And you know, when you're from Minnesota and you're Scandinavian, you know, you talk like you eat the lutefisk. We've still got lutefisk from 1965 in our fridge. It's good in case the car gets stuck, you know, you put it under the tires in the snow. Melts it right down. Also, we'll take a finish off of a table. But the great thing about it is when I was growing up, a lot of people thought Christopher Columbus discovered America, but we knew that it was Leif Erikson. Everyone knew that. And they tried to sell us that line. But we know the Vikings came over here. Big sword. Hey, Moosky, Lena, you seem to be deeply deep. This is rumored to be, and, and we believe that it is, the exact location that the Kensington rune stone was found. The story is that the farmer was grubbing trees in order to have an agriculture field, and that in the roots of a tree, the rune stone came up. It is believed to have been put there by the Vikings in the year 1362, which means the Vikings were here before Columbus. People in this area really believe that it is authentic. If I could prove that the Kensington rune stone were authentic, I could probably run for public office, who knows? But, uh, but I, I, I think there would be everything to gain from being able to prove the rune stone was authentic. It can't be shown. This is a long time ago, uh, almost 100 years ago. And, and there are still people that are just absolutely convinced that there is no way that Olaf Ullman would have made that story up. He just wasn't that kind of guy, is what they say. Even the, the exalted Smithsonian Institution made noises about how the rune stone could be a, a representation of a very important chapter in American history. The weight of opinion among professional runologists is that the rune stone doesn't look anything like, and it is not constructed linguistically, anything like a medieval runic message. I think it's real. I think it's real. Well, I think they actually came here. I do. I think it's a farce, but it's an interesting farce. <laughs> Olaf Ullmann and others who carved the stone pulled off one of the great hoaxes in the history of scholarship and in the history of science. It stands truly as a monument to, uh, to Scandinavian humor. Olaf Ullmann himself was not a joking type of person. He was a very quiet man, and according to people who knew him, um, uh, he was rather uh, reserved and silent. I never met him. Uh, I did meet some of his children, and my impression that I got from them was that they were not lying about it. They were, they, they just absolutely did not carve it, and, the, and for somebody to say they did was a total insult to them. And I think that's where most of the strong feelings come from around here. I don't believe the Vikings were ever here, if you mean in Minnesota. In North America, yes. There's good evidence that the Vikings explored and even briefly settled the far eastern fringe of North America and the northeastern fringe. But in Minnesota, no. No Vikings here. No evidence of Vikings on the Kensington Rune Stone itself. If the Vikings absolutely didn't do it, and if Olaf Oman didn't do it, then I don't know. Anything's possible. <laughs> Oh, 
All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. First communion song will be hymn number 11. The idea for the polka mass came because I know there was a need for it. A lot of the songs we had, they were boring, a lot of those songs, some of those hymns, really. And I felt we need something new, something better. My mother begged me not to have the mass. She said, son, don't have the polka mass. What will people say? And then after the mass, went back to the rectory, and the phone start ringing, and the doorbell, and people coming in saying, great, this is terrific. Then she said, I like it. People relate with it. It's their music, and all they're praying to God with it. Can't miss. The first one we use is a polka. The original song was called Tavern in the Valley, and so we changed it to Church in the Valley. The Barking Dog Polka, <laughs> that's uh, one of our offertory hymns, and uh, that's an old uh, folk tune, a drinking song, actually, and uh, now we've made a hymn out of it. And we do it in church. I think it's uplifting, you know, the music is uh, peppy. In church of folk, you know, <laughs> we've had people almost dancing in the aisles, you know. So that, that's uplifting to them, too. So it, it makes us feel good, and I, I like that. This is makes you alive and happy and uh, happy in the Lord. It's great. You use all kinds of things. God created all kinds of music, didn't he? People will say, a polka band in church, you know, beer hall music in church. What is, what's going on? It has to be churchy, they say. Well, what's churchy? Church music is anything that raises your mind and heart to God. I like this, it's kind of new, isn't it, really? I like the music, the liturgy and all. It's beautiful. I love to sing, and this is for me, boy. I tell you, yeah, it, you boy, bet. It's a mass of the people, and I think it's beautiful. Everywhere I go, the people love the folk mass. And the attendance is great. They're standing room only. And people would say a lot of times, um, wonder what the Pope thinks, you know, about the polka mass. So I said, well, let's find out what he thinks. Let's go to Rome and give him a polka mass. We got a group of people, about 80 people, and we went to the Vatican. We had a um, polka mass at the high altar, one of the high altars there, where people from all over the world are there. And then we had an audience with the Holy Father. At this mass, we played all of the songs from the polka mass for him. And I told him that the polka mass is uh, well accepted in the country. It's tastefully done and everything. And he's a very good uh, go, go ahead with it, you know. So there we go. So you're pretty convinced that he, that he liked it? He liked it. His little red shoes were tapping during this whole thing. And I wasn't <laughs> suspended. <laughs> I'm still a priest in good standing. <laughs> we rocked the Vatican <laughs> polkas. Go in peace now to love God and love the polka. Well, there you have it, only in Minnesota. You know, next time you see me, pull me aside and do that thing. It makes me feel good. Louie, we're Minnesotans. Give me that little look. Mm -hmm. We saw you on that show, only in Minnesota. You know, you can only see that in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Well, bye now. Take care, baby.
Family in Minnesota with Louis Anderson was made possible in part by a grant from the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores. This program was produced by KTCA, a Minnesota original.